And so that makes perception a very weird phenomenon. For another reason, I, I was always amused, for example, when, when, when I traveled with my family when I was young uh, on our summer vacations, we used to do things like get out and look at the border between Canada and the United States. And that's a very weird thing to do because you can actually do it and you can step across it. And people treat that as if it's magic in some sense because part of us knows that that border is not there, right? It's not a part of the objective world. And yet, well, and yet it is because there you are standing beside it. And then if you look at aerial views, you can see the farmer's fields end exactly where the border is. And so things like borders between countries habit, inhabit this weird space between the objective and the subjective that's a magic space and it actually turns out that almost everything we perceive has that degree of magicality about it. I've thought also about such things as people's proclivity to go to museums maybe in Nashville for example or Memphis to go look at Elvis Presley's guitar and you think well what exactly are you looking at when you go look at Elvis Presley's guitar because first of all it's a mass-produced guitar and so why not just look at another guitar, and you think, well, that's not the same thing. It's like, well, why isn't it the same thing? Because it's not. And the reason is, is that the guitar is not merely something, and this is the thing you perceive, it's not merely something made up of the guitar atoms, let's say, and the guitar molecules. It's also an artifact that was embedded in a context across a period of time. And that embeddedness of that artifact is part of what you perceive when you see an artifact like a celebrity, something a celebrity owned, or the relic of a saint, let's say. And so, and you can say, well, that's all an overlay on top of perception, and that would be fine, except that's wrong. There's no data, so to speak, that support that viewpoint. That's not how perception works. Perception is unbelievably complicated. So, we see regularities of being, and some of those impediments and affordances is the technical term, we tend to perceive as objects, but we also see the possibilities of being. But the problem with that is that the world of objects, potentially relevant objects, and the world of possibility is vast beyond our comprehension. And so then we have another problem that emerges as a consequence of that, which is a key and signal problem, and the fact that it has been solved precipitously and carelessly, hastily, is actually the reason for the culture war that's raging today. And that is that we have to prioritize our perceptions. We have to prioritize our perceptions to get access to the sense data that hypothetically informs us. We have to see the world through a system of value. And why would I say a system of value? Well, a system of value is a system of priorities. Right, Because to value something is to make it more important than other things that it's being compared to. And why do you need a hierarchy of perceptual priority in order to see? And the answer is, well, you can't see everything at once. And so you can only see one thing at a time. And which thing? And the answer is, the thing you think is most important to see at that moment. And then the question is, well, and this is the question, why is that the most important thing to see at the moment? So imagine, this is true in the auditory domain, in the tactile domain, all sensory domains, and the, you think that perception is a passive action and that we act upon the consequences of our perception, and this is just not true at all. There's no level of the analysis of perception, neurophysiologically, where you can separate action from perception. So, for example, when you're looking at the world, although you don't know this, your eyes are moving back and forth very, very quickly. They have to move. If they stop moving for more than a tenth of a second, you go blind because you saturate the neurons that are, you're using to perceive so intensely with the repetitive stimulation that they just shut down. And so, at a micro level, your eyes are vibrating like mad, and then there are cicads above that that are still unconscious, that are less rapid and wider, and then voluntarily, you have voluntary eye fields in the frontal cortex, you move your eyes voluntarily to point to what you want to see, and you do that because the center part of your vision is exceptionally high resolution. Each center vision foveal neuron is connected directly to 10,000 neurons at the primary, in the primary visual cortex, and then each of those 10,000 
is connected to another 10,000. It's very expensive neurophysiological real estate. And if all of your vision was as intensely high resolution as your fovea, which is a very small part of your retina, you'd have to have a brain like an alien. Because half your brain at any given moment, especially for human beings, is actually taken up with the problem of resolving the world into conscious vision. And that's all motorically dependent. And so, in some sense, real sense, seeing is very much akin to feeling out. You're, you know, if you're investigating the structure of something like this column, if you close your eyes, you can build a visual image of the column. Blind people, by the way, many of them can draw, just so you know, even if they've been blind from birth. Because they, they, they generate visual representations of the world, they just don't have light and color. But they still have the sense of the three-dimensional structure of the world. They know what the shape of objects are. They know they can see their loved one's faces by using their hands as eyes. And we use our eyes as hands as well, because we feel out the world with our hands, or with our eyes. So, so don't be thinking that it's passive perception and then an overlay of prioritization and action. The, the problem of prioritization goes all the way down to the micro level with regards to perception. Okay, so now you have to prioritize your perceptions. Why? There's too many things to look at, and you can't look at everything at once. And so then the question is, well, how do you prioritize your perceptions? And the answer is, well, you make one thing at every moment that actually allows you to act, even to move your eyes, even in a restaurant to focus in on the conversation that your first date is having with you, as opposed to all the other conversations that are going on around you. That's all dependent on motor action in the auditory perception system. To prioritize what you're seeing indicates that you exist within a hierarchy of value. Why a hierarchy? Well, because everything has to exist in your perceptual structure in relationship to everything else. And so, well, let's take the example of the date. Why are you listening to what your new potential partner is saying rather than the background conversations. You might say, well, I want to hear what she has to say. Well, and then you might ask, well, why? And you might say, well, I want to be polite. And you, you might say, why? Well, it's, I like this girl and I would like to explore the possibility of a relationship. Why? Well, because I believe that having a relationship with someone is valuable and that's a subset of the notion that having relationships is valuable and that's a subset of the notion perhaps of having stable long-term loving monogamous relationships are the highest form of relationship and that's a subset of the notion that well as you progress through life one of the things you do is find a partner and establish a family and perhaps have children and contribute to the community in that way and that's part of being a good citizen let's say and that's part of being a good person, and then that, there's an outside nesting of that too, because one question might be, well, what do you mean to be a good person? And of course, that's the problem of the Logos. And the answer to that would be something like, well, I want to be the proper mediator between possibility and actuality such that the best possible actuality can be manifested by the possibility that I confront. And every bloody thing you do, everything you see, is either nested in a unified hierarchy like that, or it's not. So let's say what happens if it's not. Well, we actually know what happens if it's not. And let's say you're not unified psychologically in your value orientation. Okay, what's the consequence? Well, entropy. That's the first consequence. It's like, are you doing one thing? Which you know what you're doing and can commit yourself to and can actually undertake. Or are you so confused that you need to do 15 things at the same time? And you don't know which of them is most important. And the importance, by the way, is diluted by the multiplicity, right? Because if you pick something out as singularly important, you actually elevate it as important. If 15 things all of a sudden become equally important, they're all 1 15th as important, because if they weren't, you wouldn't have a problem sequencing them. And that means they're not motivating.